Hello there, everyone. Can you all hear me? I can hear me. <laughs> so I have a timer here. I have no clue what I'm going to talk about, but uh, I'm Knut. I'm uh, a guy who wrote some books about Bitcoin. And uh, I went to Riga three years ago in 2019, and I bought 50 copies of Sovereignty Through Mathematics in, uh, in my hand luggage. Do you know that book? Has anyone read it? <laughs> one person over there and another one. <laughs> All right. But anyway, I gave out like 25 of those books. I sold or bartered the, the other 25 to important people in Bitcoin. Got to meet all, all my idols and everything. And after that, this, this sort of Bitcoin thing took off for me in, in ways I could never have imagined. And during my journey from there to here, I've noticed a couple of things about Bitcoiners. Uh, I've received countless amounts of help from other Bitcoiners uh, when it comes to like translations, proofreadings, editing, video productions, you name it, all sorts of stuff. I've been given art, I've been, you know, Bitcoiners have given me stuff f for free or what felt like for free. But the thing is, like, I, I sort of gave something back as well. But the, the, the curious thing I noticed about this uh, is that, like, we help each other all the time and we form groups on Telegram and have little projects here and there about this and that. But we, we very rarely use Bitcoin in the sense of sending sats back and forth to each other. It's very common for Bitcoiners to just help one another. So I started to think about that and why that is. Why, why are Bitcoiners more helpful to one another than the normies? And I realized that, um, first, first of all, Bitcoiners have an incentive to help one another because we want to see one, uh, we want to see our fellow Bitcoiners succeed because we want to see Bitcoin succeed. So, so we're all incentivized to help one another. And furthermore, we're, um, we adopt a lower time preference. So, so we're reluctant to spend our sats and we know that other Bitcoiners are sort of reluctant to spend their sats too because they want to hodl them. And some people say like spending Bitcoin is using Bitcoin, but I think there are way more use cases than that. Like hodling is a use case for instance, but it goes even deeper. Um, like I realized that I, I could have done all this Bitcoin stuff without ever really touching the network, um, I guess I wouldn't have been incentivized to do all this stuff. But theoretically, at least, uh, I could have met all these people. They could have helped me. I could have helped them without us ever touching, touching the actual network Bitcoin and the, the protocol and the money or not even that. So nowadays, when people ask me, what is Bitcoin, the, the question that every Bitcoiner gets, my answer is that it's, it's an agreement between people on a fixed set of rules. And that's, that's like the least amounts of words I can use to describe what I, how I view Bitcoin. So it's like the rules of chess. If, if you know the rules of chess, you can play chess with almost every other, or you can play chess with every other chess player in the world. You can choose to play by other rules, like if you play on a board that's 64 times 64 squares instead of 8 times 8, but with the, with the same number of uh, pieces. But then you're playing chess cash or chess Satoshi's vision, and you won't have as many people to play with. So. So Bitcoin, the idea, and us agreeing on this fixed set of, you know, 21 million tokens, the resistance to replicability, that this is the solution to the double spending problem. Um, 
the way I see it is that the, the double spending problem cannot be double solved. This, this is the shot we've got at an absolutely scarce thing. Uh, and what that does to, to our psyches is the real killer app of Bitcoin. It's, it's not that we need a, a Bitcoin to be a killer app of something. It's, it's you and me that are the killer app of Bitcoin because it changes how we interact with not only each other, but how we interact with ourselves. Because of this in incentive to save rather than spend all the time. So um, another way to put that is um, a quote from my grandfather, which is the insight that that which you can do without, you own. Uh, it's the flip side of how your possessions end up owning you. So, so this is a philosophical insight. And I, I, I think that Bitcoin is getting people closer to this, this philosophy that, we can, that we, we can do without we own. So when you don't crave a, a golden Lambo, you don't need a golden Lambo. When you don't crave a Lambo at all, you, you sort of own all the Lambos in the world because you have no need for Lambos anymore. And the, to me, this is, this is the really weird thing about this, is that over time, as, as, as I try to imagine what the future on, a, on like a Bitcoin standard or whatever you may call it might be, post-hyper-Bitcoinization, you get to a place where we don't need money as much as we do now. So, so, and this is the weirdest thing, that the necessity for transactions to happen at all goes down and not up. But so, you know, Bitcoin is called money, but it's not really money. It's just mathematics, uh, a mathematical experiment running in the back of our minds. So we know we have this thing. We, ho we know we have something which people can't take away from us and people can't stop us from spending. And then that changes who we are. So by running Bitcoin in the back of our heads, the private key to a Bitcoin address, like in Bitcoin, knowing a private key is owning those Bitcoins. So there's no, there's no difference between knowing and owning anymore. So, so by running this experiment in the back of our heads, we unlock something within ourselves. So I, these days I view a Bitcoin private key as a literal key to your heart. So, so you can wear it on your sleeve in public. I mean... That's, I, I think the Beatles were right. All you need is love. And they just hadn't found the correct equation for love yet, which is Satoshi's equation with the, the halvings and everything. And maybe the, the answer is this, I don't know. But um, that's why I feel Bitcoin, the idea is so much bigger than Bitcoin, the, the protocol, Bitcoin, the network, Bitcoin, the money, Bitcoin, the commodity, however you may choose to frame it. Because it's not about mathematics and it's not about, you know, a program or a, a protocol or about network technology. It's about, it's about us and how we interact with each other and how we interact with ourselves and it, it changes us at the core. Uh, and that's, that, that's the message I want to spread if I, if, if, if I have these minutes to spread, spread a message here. Because there's so much focus on the problems with Bitcoin and how do we increase privacy and how, how do we solve that, this and that problem and how um, it's dangerous to call it inevitable because then we, we might miss something here. While I do believe that all of those technical discussions are, are important, the more important thing is to realize that the, the thing it unlocks within us, the, the philosophical insights that may come out of this thing, are, are much more important. Because, because we had this ability all along. We had the ability to interact voluntarily with each other instead of violently, which is what, what all other money... You have a third party that can print more of it and leech off of your share of a transaction. But a, a transaction in the sound money 
it, it's just another consensual interaction between two people. There's no, there's no difference between like a voluntary interaction or consensual interaction and a transaction in, in, in damn near perfect money. So, so that's it. We're, we're getting to a world where we can do things voluntarily instead of doing things under threat and with a gun to our heads. So uh, here's the Bitcoin optimism, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the new word I want to introduce. In, instead of calling it maximalism or whatever you know, derogatory term they, they try to impose on us, it's, it, we're just optimistic about the future. Everyone else is worried about, you know, Putin and energy crisis and uh, global warming and all of these uh, enemies that are hard to put a finger on who they are and what to do about them. And everyone has different ideas about that. When we could focus on, like, we, we've got this. We, we've got social media. We've got video conferencing on, by the push of a button, so you can talk to someone on Hawaii. <laughs> Uh, without no effort, and we have Bitcoin, so we have the, the the foundational base layer of all of this, which is absolute trust, trustworthy money. Uh, so that's that's the the strange thing: the don't trust, verify attitude of Bitcoiners enables us to to trust one another on mass. So we, we can we can trust we can trust each other to a larger extent because we've got this in the base layer of society now. So, so everything I hear about this or that hedge fund and all the money are there and they're, they're going through this and uh, we need this sort of adoption here and this is not working because of some legal... For forget all that. It's, all, it's just about you and me interacting voluntarily with one another. Every, everything in Bitcoin is voluntary. You don't have to use it, but you can. And if you do, you can use it in so many more ways than to just send sats to one another. You can use it to unlock something in yourself and to unlock something in your fellow man. Time preference, uh, a high time preference. If, if you've been robbed of everything you own, uh, you adopt a high time preference. Most, most people in this no, uh, room know about this concept. So a high, t high time preference makes you fearful uh, because you, you need to find food and shelter t to just survive for the rest of the day. Uh, that, that makes you fearful of, of other human beings. If you have a low time preference, if you know that you're financially secured because you have a stack of Bitcoin somewhere, you can afford to, to be the opposite of fearful, which is loving. So a low time preference, time preference from high to low, uh, it's the same scale as from fear to love. The lower the time preference, the more loving of thy neighbor you can afford to be. So that's where I think Bit Bitcoin's killer app is at. Bitcoin's killer app, it's is what it will do to each and every one of us when we really grasp what this thing is, what, what, what an amazing discovery something that can't be copied on the internet is. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions for me? Well, well, anyway, it's, it's good, good to see, see you all. You, you, you can, can find, find all my stuff at knutsronom.com. Welcome back to the Bitcoin uh, Magazine Analyst Desk, brought to you by BitGo. We are live at Bitcoin Amsterdam, and I'm joined to my left with Greg Foss and none other than Prince Philip as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on this desk, and I'd love to just follow up on our conversation for a moment. We have officially gotten word that the UK bonds have crossed over 5%. Prince Philip, what do you feel like? What What is that? statement mean to you hearing that these bonds continue to creep higher and higher? Well, that's, that's crazy to hear that right now. I just came back from the UK two weeks ago, and 
to finish my job in finance and I work in asset manager. I, I, I used to work at asset management and people weren't really talking about it as, as that much of a problem. And this is an asset manager who's managing pension funds. And these, that fixed income is blowing up in our faces right now. And there wasn't panic on the, I would say panic, but there wasn't a fear on the floor. And now here we are, as you said, over 5%. This is going to destroy pension funds. There's going to be, there's going to be exit out of pension funds. I know I'm getting my pension fund out of there. It's going straight into Bitcoin. So I would just continue that thought, and it's a great thought. The unfortunate thing is so many people don't understand the risk that was taken because monetary policy suppressed proper returns. Mm. The pension funds went out and they had to borrow money. They, it, they took a strategy that levered their bond returns, and leverage works when the bond prices go up, you enhance returns. The problem is when bond prices go down, you enhance your losses as well. Um, I feel horrible for the British pensioners that have worked their whole lives to put their money in a store of value called UK gilts, which have lost over 50% of their value in one year. This is dangerous for the world understand that this is because of the central bank policies that artificially push down yields and returns. Greg, you have experienced having lived through and worked through the 2007-2008 crisis. How much of this current iteration of what we're dealing with is negligence versus just people who just don't understand and were given authority to make decisions they ought not to have? Well, I can't answer it that way, but I will tell you that I am almost as concerned right now as I was in 2008, 2009 about the implosion of the financial system as we know it right now. I don't believe that the world will accept another kicking of the can down the road. They, they, they're beginning to understand this money printing uh, disease and the results that it leads to. So... What we need is education. We've talked about that. We need to be honest about the realities facing people and the Fiat Ponzi disease. It's not sustainable. That is, we need the solution. I believe the solution to be Bitcoin. All paths lead to Bitcoin. It's that simple. Prince Philip, do you share Greg's sentiment that this could be the end of it? I, well... Or am I just yeah. being too optimistic <laughs> well, here? Well, we don't yeah. want it to end, though. No. You, you, well, I don't think we're ready, uh, right? I, so, I was just going to say, I yeah. don't think we're ready for it to end. I don't think, I don't think they will... Uh, I think they will keep kicking, that, the, kicking the can down until it ends. And I think at that point, we have to, I guess, sell Bitcoin, the story about Bitcoin, and make it a smooth transition from that standard to the Bitcoin standard. It's, I, I see no other alternative. Well, and we can take the example of El Salvador. Just beautiful. put it on the, on the side, uh, put it on the, on, on the side by side with the, with the fiat currency, with the US dollar, using the Bitcoin rails and all that. And people in time will learn about the store of value of that is Bitcoin. So I hope that's the model that we'll go down towards. But there's other talks about, you know, going, uh, are we going to end up in the CBDCs? Are they going to purposely crash the, the economy? So we will have to Bretton Woods again, and they'll, they'll, they'll introduce a subject to CBDCs. But I think the banks won't like, like that. The banks will wake up and say, no, that's our jobs on the line. We'll rather go for Bitcoin. Interesting take. I, I do want to say as well, uh, we are keeping score for all of our British audience. We, do, we are aware that they've already said they're changing from quantitative easing to tightening but it looks like they're going to shortly have to change back to quantitative easing once again. Uh, be sure, if you are not already, to like and subscribe down below. We will be back after this next panel on Lightning Nodes.